India needs to decarbonize its energy sector and fast. One less recognized way of doing it is what we are going to talk about in this video. It is about integrating the grids of Sri Lanka and India. When you think of decarbonizing a country's energy sector, what comes to your mind? Renewable energy, right? And when you think of renewable energy, which challenge jumps to your mind? It is the intermittency, the fickle nature of renewable energy. Wind does not blow all the time, the sun does not shine all the time, and we cannot have a power system in which, you know, sometimes wind comes, wind blows and energy flows, sun shines, electricity flows, and then it goes up and down. You can't have an energy system like that. That's a very big problem in handling renewable energy. The conventional way of tackling this problem has been building storage facilities. But there is one other way of doing it, which is to build a very vast power grid, very vast network of transmission lines. The sheer vastness of the grid will kind of level off surpluses in demand and supply. The idea here is to interconnect grids. The broad idea is to have a global grid, something like the Buckminster Fullerene structure the entire world is connected, but that is a long way off. For now, the immediate thought is to interconnect countries into regions and interconnect regions to make some sort of a large grid. So that at some point there is renewable energy injection and some point there is demand for renewable energy and we are able to use more and more of renewable energy and that will help in decarbonizing the energy sector. This is the broad thought. Every country, policy makers in most countries are having this thought, including India. And this is the thought which has given rise to the concept, one sun, one world, one grid, or also Vogue, which is uh, the brainchild of uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, he has given it to the International Solar Alliance for implementation. People are working on it. This is also the thought that gave rise in 2016 to what the government of India called the cross-border trade in electricity guidelines. So this thought is very much alive. The idea is to build a whole huge grid. Just look at what is happening all around us in the world. Only on July 20, a few days earlier, it was announced that the Viking Link cable, a 764 kilometer subsea cable connecting Denmark and the United Kingdom was commissioned. This today is the world's longest subsea undersea cable and a 5000 kilometer long cable that connects Port Darwin in Australia to Singapore is under implementation, is under construction. Uh, this is being done by uh, an Australian company called Sun Cable. It will take a few more years to come, but they are, it's pretty much underway. And when this comes, remember, several of these ASEAN countries are already interconnected. So what this particular cable means is that a lot of power from renewable energy rich Australia can be transmitted to the densely populated region of ASEAN. So that is happening. So $20 billion project that is pretty much underway today. Look at the other side, the west of India, the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is a grouping of the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, they have taken an initiative to extend a 295 kilometer cable transmitting power from GCC countries to Iraq. And the idea is to take it further to Jordan. The point I'm trying to make is all over the world, all around us, this grid interconnection is happening. And here is a big opportunity for India to do something in this area. And India is also interconnecting. It is not as though India is not doing anything. Indian grid is connected to Nepal and Bhutan and Bangladesh. And we are getting substantial amounts of hydropower from Nepal and Bhutan. And as we speak, a 2000 kilometer line connecting Lucknow to Mayat Kina in Myanmar at a cost of $3.8 billion dollars is also under consideration. With so much happening all around the world, it's a bit sad that one much simpler project 
connecting Sri Lanka and India from the Sri Lankan city of Anuradhapura and Madurai in Tamil Nadu. This project proposal has been hanging fire for two decades or so. And now this project assumes even greater significance because of the urgent need to decarbonize India's energy sector. A US public funded laboratory called National Renewable Energy Laboratories. About a couple of decades back, NREL did a study and determined that Sri Lanka has onshore wind potential of 45,000 megawatts, 45 gigawatts. This is two decades ago. With today's technology, and I'm guessing here, it should be pretty easy to put up about 60 gigawatts or 70 gigawatts in Sri Lanka onshore. Sri Lanka itself would probably need about 10 gigawatts, not more than that. All the surplus energy can be transmitted to India. Clean, green energy, low cost energy. Sri Lanka can earn money from India by exporting energy like Nepal does, Bhutan does. And I don't have to tell you the geopolitical implications of such a move. It could only bring these two countries closer to each other. And Indian wind energy developers will have another market to play, the Sri Lankan market. This is only wind energy and that to onshore. If you take near shore Sri Lanka and if you take offshore Sri Lanka and the enormous hydro potential that Sri Lanka has, you will be able to import into India a lot more of renewable energy from Sri Lanka if only this line came into existence. When it was conceived, it was about $450 million project, probably gone up a little bit now. I don't know for what reasons, but it's been hanging fire for a long time. And this is much cheaper than the offshore projects that the Indian government is preparing for off the Tamil Nadu coast and Gujarat coast. That is going to be pretty expensive, much more expensive than buying renewable power from Sri Lanka. It's eminently doable, it is technically and economically feasible, politically sensible perhaps, but it's not being done. All right, all this while it was not done because maybe there were so many considerations. We do not want to go into all that, but today there is an urgency to do it because we have to decarbonize our energy sector. By the way, Sri Lanka is a low hanging fruit, but not the only fruit. There are rich possibilities to interconnect it, India, Indian grid to some other countries also. For example, the Chinese company China Electric Power has proposed two transmission lines connecting Dojiang in China to Kolkata and another one from Gongbujiang Da to Jabalpur. These two lines can again get low cost hydropower from China. Whether these lines connecting China and India are geopolitically feasible today or not, we don't know. Maybe they are not, but they might happen sometime. Therefore, these are topics for discussion for another day. But today, the central message is Sri Lanka and India should be interconnected. With so many huge projects going all around the world, it's a bit of a shame that we are not able to do the simple one. And if we did that, it will go a long way in decarbonizing India's energy sector.